On behalf of the Jensen family, we express our appreciation to all who have gathered here today for the services for Helen Finley Jensen. I am Bishop Carl Perkins. I will be conducting these services. It is my privilege and honor to serve you this day. Seated on the stand with me is my counselor, Brother Brad Johnson. Prior to the services this morning, the family gathered and the family prayer was offered by Matthew Osler. We would like to thank Sister Shannon Housley and Sister Nancy Bott for the music this morning. We will begin these services by singing hymn number 136, I Know That My Redeemer Lives, after which the invocation will be given by Melissa Coleman.
kind, dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful we were able to come here today and celebrate Grandma and her life. Please help us to fill thy spirit here today that we can be comforted and we're so thankful for the family and friends who have come to be here with us today and please help us to feel thy love and we're grateful for our family and those who weren't able to make it please bless them that they will feel thy comfort as well and we say these things humbly in the name of thy son jesus christ amen we would like to um start our meeting by hearing the life sketch by Brad Johnson, and then we'll hear some memories of Grandma from some of the grandchildren, Daniel Osler, Mackenzie Rockwood, Adam Jensen, Casey Henderson, and Carly Rose. Following those memories, we have a musical number, Popcorn Popping will be sung by the great-grandchildren. That will be accompanied by Jasmine Jensen and an introduction by Alexandra Osler. Following that musical number, we'll hear from Scott Jensen, and we'll proceed to that point. Brad. I want to thank the bishop for all he's done for us, uh, but I'm still Jensen. I'm not a Johnson. Uh, our sweet mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother, Helen Jensen, passed away quietly in her sleep on May 5th at the age of 89. She was born in Star Valley, Smoot, Wyoming, on September 27, 1927, to Gertrude and Hugh Finley. She was the seventh of nine children. All but two of her younger brothers, Gary and Paul, had preceded her in death. Helen grew up in Smoot and graduated from Star Valley High School in 1945 where she was active in student government and cheerleading. She married her high school sweetheart, Ward Jensen, on March 14, 1947 in the LDS Temple in Logan, Utah. Ward and Helen raised five children together while residing in Brigham City, Utah. Helen was an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She held callings from Relief Society president to primary chorister, the latter of which she enjoyed so much because of the music of the children were the her great loves, because music and children were her great loves. She enjoyed singing with the children and in choirs, trios, and quartets over the years, and Helen also loved sewing, crocheting, and quilting. Anyone who knew Helen would describe her in these two words, kind and loving. She was always thinking of others, went out of her way to help anyone in need. She found her greatest joy in serving others. Any new in-law who joined the family was welcomed warmly by Helen and made to feel at home and loved. Her example of love and caring over the years has had a positive impact on each member of the family and uh, children through great-grandchildren. The family would like to express all their thanks and love to the Maple Springs for the Integrity Home Health Care for all the care they gave Mother down at, uh, um, while she was down at Maple Springs. Helen was preceded in death by her husband, Ward, but she leaves five children, Trudy, William Osler, Chuck Jensen, Brad, Karen Jensen, Bonnie, Kurt Henderson, and Scott, Sherry Jensen, 18 grandchildren and 37 great-grandchildren. And um, I would like to maybe just say a few things um, about mom. <clears throat> she came from a good lineage. Finley's. Um, her middle name was always was just F, Helen F. Jensen. And uh, Trudy, Chuck, and Bonnie all got middle names. Scott and I just got F. And uh, over the years, Mom and Dad would have discussion. I kept asking what the F stands for, and no, it doesn't stand for Frank, just so you know. They would have discussions that it was always Dad's middle name, which was F, but it stood for Flukiger. But I'm proud to say it, Mom always won, and it was Finley. And uh, proud to say that I can, my middle name, even though it's F, stands for Finley because they're great, great people. 
Um, Dad was a mechanical engineer and he could redneck anything. If Dad wanted to put it together, great, great apparatuses that would work. They weren't pretty, but they would work. And when he would do something or remodeling in the home, he did not like sheetrock, so he would put one coat of mud as far as he would go. So that meant that mother had to wallpaper. If anybody was ever in our home growing up, you know that mom had more wallpaper, and she was as good as anybody I ever knew. She could change the, the texture, the tone of everything of, a, of the home by just adding wallpaper to the room. Um, we're living in the home right now, and uh, as we've done some remodeling, I swear there's been four and five layers of wallpaper that I've had the opportunity of seeing as we've been working on the home. In fact, there's some, some rooms still have the wallpaper up. Uh, and then there are also special things about Mother was the arts and crafts. Uh, she was always busy. Her hands were always busy. She was always doing something. And I'm sure you noticed, if you were able to make through that trip, that talent was passed on to the granddaughters. Uh, I've never seen a, a neater little display than what they did for Grandma back in the back. And Mom touched all of those things. We love her, we miss her, and I honor her. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So I was told that I have a half an hour to speak. Does that sound good? Um, if there's one negative I can, thing I can say, say about Grandma, which is probably not the best way to start a talk, is that um, thanks to her, I find it very hard to go to bed at a reasonable time. Um, I, uh, we have three sons, my wife and I, and our youngest I was able to, to name. She didn't let me name the first two. I made his middle name Jensen. And go figure, out of the three boys, he has a hard time getting to bed before midnight. Um, so I, I do not enjoy public speaking, but uh, Grandma is so important to me that I feel it an honor to share some memories. For those of you who don't know me, I'm one of Trudy's sons. And we lived relatively far from Brigham City, so we only got to see Grandma maybe once or twice a year, but <clears throat> I don't feel like the geographic distance uh, diminished the closeness or affection that I felt from them or, or for them. Um, I largely attribute that to Grandma. She just... That was part of her nature. When I asked my wife, Sherida, what she thought of Grandma, what thoughts she had of her, she said, and I quote, she was such a loving and caring person from the very moment that I met her, she made me feel like I was part of the family. And I'm sure that those who married into the Jensen family can attest to that, that um, you, know, you probably have very similar feelings. <clears throat> if I could succinctly encapsulate grandma in a phrase, I think it would be unconditional love. Uh, that's what I felt from her. So even though we lived relatively far from grandma and grandpa, they seemed to be present for every important event from baptisms to graduations to ordinations to, to weddings. Um, at the time, I didn't realize what a sacrifice it was, but I imagine it was I mean, older, you, you realize those things. Um, I always liked getting Grandma's birthday cards with tons of dollar bills taped to the inside. She continued that with my kids, her great-grandkids, and they still talk about it. That and the Christmas packages that had caramel popcorn balls and Grandma's fudge or caramels. Um, Grandma was such a pleasant person to be around, whether it was delivering Avon, which actually Carly, I did not get paid nor did I get any treat for delivering Avon. <laughs> Although who knows, maybe she, she slipped me a 50 and I just forgot. 
Um, so whether it was doing that or working on puzzles with grandma, um, she was just a pleasant person to be around. When, um, when I think of grandma, I'm transported back to a warm summer day in Brigham City, a lot warmer than today. Um, she's sitting in her chair with Suki at her feet, um, working on a crossword puzzle or, or stitching one of her masterpieces, and I'm sitting in the chair close to her, looking at some tabloid like the Sun or National Enquirer. Somebody had a baby with an alien. Or, and um, we're, of course, watching the TV. There's a game show going on. And we're waiting for one of my aunts or uncles to come through the door, or cousins to come through the door. Um, that's how I like to picture her. Um, the last few years were hard for her. And for that reason, I'm happy that she's, she's liberated. And I'm grateful for the lasting impression that she had on me. Thank you. Okay, I'm Mackenzie and I'm Chuck's daughter. And if I can get through this. Today I am speaking to the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren on Grandma's behalf. As we all witnessed, Grandma got very sad and depressed and anxious the last few months and even years that she was here. Um, I came to realize that there were times that she was more likely to express this than others. Um, on March 31st, I was able to stop in and see her by myself without the noise, chaos, and laughter that my three young boys bring. She always liked to sit close and hold your hand. Personal touch was very comforting to her. As I sat and held her well manicured hand, I asked her what was bothering her. After some prodding, she was able to put it into words. I have many things weighing on my mind, she said. Most of all, my grandkids. She said, there are many things I want to tell them, but I don't think they'll listen to me. This was so shocking to me because I'd grown to seek out her advice in many things, especially at this stage in my life. I told her, I said, I think they'll listen to you because they love you so much and would be happy to hear from you. Um, and she said, well, how will I tell them? And I said, well, why don't you tell me and I'll write it down and I'll make sure that they, that they get to hear everything you have to say. Her face lit up and she said, that would be really nice. I scrambled for a piece of paper and a pen and I waited. She looked at me with blank eyes and said, will you help me? I encouraged her and said, Let's start with the boys, because we have a lot of boys. <laughs> I said, what are some things that you want them to know? She said, listen up, boys. She said, remember what you've been taught in anything that you do. You have all been taught and brought up the proper way. Just remember that. Remember that. She went on to express her worries surrounding drugs and substance abuse. Please remember this. We know she was very close to the veil at this time, and she understood the harmful effects that they can have on your lives, and it was weighing very heavy on her mind. She then said, please listen to and respect your parents. 
They're trying their best and they know what is best for you. Also, ask your parents about their childhood experiences and stories that they had growing up. Ask them to share them with you. She was very visibly upset that she couldn't remember some of the history of her parents. And I tried to comfort her and say, I'm sure you know, you did know at one time. It's just escaped her at the moment. But <clears throat> She wanted the grandkids to remember to teach their kids the right ways and the right things to do. She recognized that the great-grandchildren are getting older and that this is the time they need their parents more than anything. We then moved on to the girls. I said, what would you like to say specifically to the granddaughters and great-granddaughters? She said, I also want them to remember what they were taught. And she repeated about drugs and alcohol again. She said, this is very scary to me and they need to be strong. I want them to respect their bodies and make sure that others do too. Selfishly, I then asked, what do you have to say for your granddaughters who are acting as mothers now? Because I wanted to glean as much wisdom as I could from her. She responded, we live in such a hard world for young kids nowadays. Make sure you are teaching them young and loving them often. I continued to prod for more wisdom and advice, but she seemed to be done. It reminded me of a time during my first pregnancy when I had gone in, when I went into early labor and I was terrified. She called me on the phone and she Told me, calmly told me that everything was going to be okay. She was sympathetic yet confident and shared the experience of having Aunt Bonnie early. She immediately calmed my nerves. This was my aha moment when I realized that she can relate to everything I'm going through at this time in my life. She's been through these things, some far worse, and has a lot of wisdom to share. She was always so quick to recall memories of having young children and then sympathize with me of the stress, exhaustion, and hard work that they demand. But she did it with so much love. It was clear that she loved being a mother, and we all knew that she loved being a grandmother. She had a way of making each one of us feel like we were the most important thing in the world. I can still smell her and feel her hugs. I can remember sitting on her lap and sliding off her slick polyester pants. She taught me so much and was an amazing example. Her example alone is what developed my testimony and desire to attend church as well as to choose to be married in the temple. She taught me my first hymn, sitting next to her on the bench, listening to her voice. She was my witness when I received my endowments, as well as during my wedding. I'm forever grateful I was able to share these moments with her. I just want to close with a poem. Grandma, I thought of you with love today, but that is nothing new. I thought about you yesterday and the days before that too. I think of you in silence. I often speak your name. All I have are memories and your picture in a frame. Your memory is my keepsake with which I'll never part. God has you in his keeping, but I have you in my heart. Um, I'm Adam Jensen, Brad's son. Uh, one of my fears, I guess, when I started writing this is that all of us would get up here and talk about the same thing. There's a, there's a lot of awesome memories that I have of grandma and I'm sure they all share those same memories and the more I thought about it I thought that'd be awesome to hear that to hear the, the exact same things that how grandma was so awesome with everybody and how she loved everybody and treated everybody the same so I started thinking about it what I wanted to talk about and I decided to you know get my, my siblings involved so I sent them a text 
and ask them, you know, what are some of your stories or some of the things that you remember of Grandma? And quickly, they had a lot of quick memories, just flying back and forth, and it was a really, really fun, quick experience. But there was a lot of cool stories that, that, that came up from it, and I wanted to share a few of those with you. Um, one thing that Jason brought up, it was sleeping over at Grandma's house and always getting to stay up late and, and watch The Tonight Show. Um, delivering Avon and the red Honda Civic and being so excited to get one dollar afterwards to go spend to our heart's content at 7-Eleven. Picking grapes for bottling grape juice. Um, homemade jam. Grilled cheese sandwiches with that homemade jam. I always assumed that was normal until I started making it in front of my friends and found out that they thought that was extremely gross. And, and every time I make it now, it really still reminds me of how, how gross that is, but I still love them a lot. Um, caramel popcorn for every occasion. Cabbage rolls and cinnamon bun nights. The hill, whatever ails you, aloe vera plant in the window. Word search puzzle books all over the house, especially in the bathroom. And getting your hair cut with her suspect clippers and always worrying that you might leave with a cut. One time I, I got it in my head that I, it, would be, it would be fun to, to shave my size really, really short. So I think I gave her a small complex because Grandma hated to cut your hair short. And I actually did end up leaving that day with a cut on my ear. So <laughs> um, Whenever I stayed home sick from school, I would go to Grandma's house. We would always watch game shows, play with toys under the stairs, play hide and seek down in the basement, or play in Grandpa's creepy old shed in the backyard. There was always something fun to do at Grandma's house. She always had a new project for the grandkids that she would make for them. One year she, she sewed all the boys stuffed footballs. Another year she made everyone a calendar out of the plastic canvas that she's famous for. And who can forget the awesome stuffed dinosaurs? I mean, that was my favorite. As everyone knows, Grandma loved to quilt and sew, and more often than not, I mean, I, I, I can remember most of my memories going over there, there was the quilting table set up down in the basement, either for a wedding or a newborn baby. And I remember many opportunities that she gave us to, to, to put the pins in for her to help her out. And of course, uh, the booties that she loved to make. A few years after Amberly and I were married, we uh, moved in with, with Grandma while, while Grandpa was in the hospital right before he passed away. Uh, I cherish that, that experience that we had with her. We, we were able to spend a lot of good quality nights with her, watching tonight's show, obviously, um, putting puzzles together. And I, I just I look back at those puzzles, just, just that, in one, that three or four month period that we were there, I think I did more puzzles then than I have in my entire life. So. Grandma spent her, her last few years at Maple Springs. Amberly and I, my wife, Amberly, if you didn't know her, um, we had a, the wonderful opportunity to eat lunch with her almost every week. We would sit at the table with her and she had multiple friends that she had made just there at Maple Springs. And I'm so grateful for them for, to help her because it, it was so hard for Grandma to, to move out of the house and have to go there. And they were, they were, they were great friends for her. Every time that we showed up, it was, it was such a joy to, to, Grandma would just light up. Her eyes would just see this light in it and huge grin on her face. And I, I think with her, her memory failing, I think two, two or three times every time we showed up, everybody is so jealous that you come and see us every week. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was an awesome, awesome experience for us to be able to share that with her. So and even though the, the food at Maple Springs, it was, it was pretty decent food for her for an assisted living, but there was times you could tell that she was getting sick of it. So we would, we would bring her some food from a fast food place close or take her, if she was filling up to it, we would take her to a local restaurant. Uh, this is actually a time that we, we enjoyed the most because when she was at the table with her friends, she, she tended to be a little more quiet, didn't say a whole lot, but when we could get her alone, we could really have some good quality one-on-one -on -one time with her and she would really open up and, and talk a lot more. She was so interested in what was going on in our lives and how everyone was doing. We would always come with new pictures of Brennan, our son, and stories of what was going on with the family, and she ate it up. Just a few months ago, I was, I was sitting with her in her room, 
And she proceeded to, to try to convince me that she was more than capable to, to drive her car and she wanted it back to go shopping. She loved to drive and missed it so much when she was no longer able to do that. In perfect grandma style, we would go to her room and she would almost always be watching game shows. She didn't always have a lot to say, but it was such a blessing for myself and Emily to have been able to spend that invaluable time with her, to fill with her love and her spirit. She was such an amazing woman and I'm going to miss her so much. I'm so glad that she's back with Grandpa and all those loved ones that went before her. I love you, Grandma. Hi, uh, my name's Casey. I'm uh, Bonnie's son. Uh, so to, to Adam's point, I was a little bit worried as well that uh, we'd all get up here and start talking about the same memories, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that I think that there's so many memories that uh, there's maybe just one that we'll touch on that, that everybody talks about, which is Avon. <laughs> Um, so when I first started thinking about uh, my memories of Grandma and, and what I wanted to say for this talk, um, all kinds of great memories started coming back to me. Um, things I hadn't really thought about in a long time, but um, you know they're always kind of tucked away in the back of your head. Um, Grandma, to me, was one of those unique people that uh, always made you feel welcome and loved. It didn't matter how long it had been since you'd seen her. It could be two months or a day, and, and you always felt like she wanted you there and, and just wanted to keep you as long as she could. <clears throat> she always made it feel like she was more interested in, in you and what you had going on in your life than uh, anything else that could be going on. Um, she, she always wanted to know how your day was, what's new in your life, um, anything that, that would keep you there and, and, and let her talk to you and, and keep you with her as long as she could. Uh, when I started putting my thoughts down on paper, uh, the recurring theme that I kept circling back to uh, was family. Uh, I, believe, uh, I believe that Grandma cared more about her family than, than maybe anything else in the world. Um, grandma and Grandpa's house to me, uh, and I think probably to, to all my cousins and family members as well, was always kind of the family gathering place. And most of my best memories uh, revolve around being at Grandma and Grandpa's house. Uh, I remember the, the annual Easter egg hunt. Um, this was every year on, on Easter, and it was at Grandma's house. And uh, the, I remember the, the, the parents uh, were always outside cooking, and it was always a little bit of a bickering contest about who was going to cook what and how it was going to get done. Um, and then the Easter egg hunt was a little bit later on in the day uh, after we had breakfast. and, and there was this big pink egg that was the grand prize. And uh, it was wrapped in pink tinfoil. And it had a note inside that said, come see grandma for a special prize. And the Easter hunt typically turned into a little bit of a milder version of the Hunger Games. <laughs> with the older kids not really uh, paying too much attention to the, the rest of the eggs that were scattered throughout the yard, but, but only care about finding the pink egg. So they would bulldoze their way through the backyard looking for the pink egg while the younger kids wandered around uh, with their parents looking for normal eggs uh, and, and basically trying to avoid being trampled. Uh, the grand prize was always hidden in grandma's sewing room and, and it usually consisted of a big basket of candy and treats and you know toys and different things like that. And I really think grandma relished uh, the Easter egg hunger games as well with the family and really just having the, the whole family over to her house um, to, to cook breakfast and to spend time with, with, uh, with one another. Um, I remember Avon. Grandma, I think Grandma at one time or another had wrangled every single grandchild into uh, this form of slave, slave labor. Um, with the, the monthly Avon books. I, I spent a lot of my time delivering them with Kyle and Chase, uh, who were, were my same age. Um, I, I can promise that all the books did not make their way to the right porches. <laughs> um, I, I think many ended up in bushes, and, and, and they definitely did not make their way to the handles um, of the doors. There's 
little cutouts on the plastic Avon book holders that was supposed to go neatly on the handle of the door per grandma's uh, requirement. And that, that didn't happen very often. Um, so, so regardless of, of the slave labor, uh, I used to love delivering Avon books with my grandma and my cousins. Um, we, we ran around the neighborhoods, and then and when we were done, uh, Grandma always paid us a dollar. And then we would run from Grandma's house down to 7-Eleven, and candy bars were 50 cents or 55 cents, so we'd grab ourselves a couple of candy bars and, and then run back to Grandma's and, and spend more time there. Uh, I remember morning pancakes. My grade school was uh, just down the block from Grandma and Grandpa's house, so I spent I spent all my mornings at, uh, at Grandma and Grandpa's house um, before school with my cousins. Uh, Grandpa used to make the pancakes uh, pretty much every morning um, while we watched Power Rangers. Um, I always loved Grandpa's pancakes the most, and that's because the way that Grandpa made them, uh, he would make them with Mickey Mouse uh, um, faces on them. And his, his uh, pancake dough batter was always the day before or a, a day after, so he'd put it in the fridge and then he'd use that dough batter to make pancakes the next day. And what happens when you do that is they turn into basically crepes. Um, so they're, they're super, super thin and I, and I loved them. Um, I remember one morning Grandpa had gone to the ranch early, uh, so Grandma was filling in with the pancake duties. And she had used fresh batter on the pancakes, and, and they turned out super fluffy and, and very, you know, much like pancakes should be. Um, I remember looking at the pancakes and asking, what was wrong with them, and why were Grandpa's better? Uh, gra Grandma looked at me with death in her eyes, um, but as as you would expect from Grandma. Her only words were, Grandpa will be back tomorrow. You'll have to deal with my pancakes today. <laughs> um, Grandma would never raise her voice to an eight-year-old or, or be angry with an eight-year-old. Um, I remember na uh, Christmas nativity. Uh, every Christmas at Grandma's house, the grandkids uh, participated, or, or were forced, rather, maybe, uh, into Christmas nativity. Uh, we dressed as wise men, Mary and Joseph, baby Jesus, uh, you know, etc. It was a whole production with costumes. We had our scripted lines. Um, I, there was camcorders all over the place. It was a Hollywood production. Uh, Grandma or orchestrated all of this for the most part, and it was a big deal to her, and, and I think that's why all the, the uh, grandkids reluctantly uh, were, were uh, participants. I've even seen some pictures recently uh, that Michael Scott's posted on Facebook that the that shows the the Christmas nativity with the grandkids looking pretty pretty miserable. Uh, but it was time with Grandma and Grandpa, at Grandma and Grandpa's house, and and I think that was a special time. And I and I look back on that now and realize um, how how much it means to me. So as I look around the room, at my parents, my aunts and uncles, my cousins. And, f and finally, my son and wife, and my soon-to-be-born daughter. To me, Grandma's influence on us and the love of family that she helped mold and instill is still obvious. And I hope that we continue to cherish each other and keep that lesson of family in our hearts. Thank you. So I am Carly Rose, and my, my uh, dad is Scott Jensen, <laughs> or Scott. Um, so this is probably the last, um, the least nervous I have ever been to stand up at a pulpit in the chapel and give a talk. <laughs> and this was the easiest talk to prepare. So thank you for that, Grandma. This chapel has a special meaning to me. When I was about seven years old, we moved in with Grandma and Grandpa while my dad decided to finish school. This chapel is where I would sit with Grandma and Grandpa and I would listen to her beautiful singing voice during each hymn. And then she would always pr pass out gum after the sacrament, or I would beg her. You could always count on her to have gum. <laughs> this church building was always where I was 
was also where I was baptized and also where my family attends church today. Grandma had a good heart and was such a good example to me. One special memory of Grandma I have is one trip to the ranch with Grandpa and Grandma when I was around six or seven. We went out there to look for Misty, her dog, that had run off on a previous trip a day or two earlier. Her and I were searching out in the fields and calling her name, and we just weren't having any luck. And finally, we stopped and, said, and she said, let's say a prayer. It was the first time that I had ever prayed for guidance or said a prayer that wasn't on a meal or at church. We left that day empty-handed, but the next morning, Grandpa found Misty waiting on the doorstep. It was a lesson on faith and prayer from Grandma that I will never forget. Her house was so magical as a little girl. Maybe this won't be so easy. <laughs> Thanks for that, Grandma. <laughs> it was fun and welcoming. It had so many fun places to play, nooks and crannies and lots of rooms and different levels. In fact, she had names for different rooms, the pink room, the red room, <laughs> and she had so many different kinds of toys, many that she made. There was always something to do. Mackenzie and I would get into her makeup as little girls, and she would find us with lipstick and makeup all over our face. Grandma was always baking and cooking. and She had a potato peeler that we used to make french fries with. And we would make these, these huge, super long, curly fry, french fries, and they were almost as exciting to make as they were to eat. I think they are still the best homemade french fries ever. She also made sticky buns, cinnamon rolls, caramel popcorn, and my, and my favorite, her bubbled bread. Sleepovers at Grandma's were always something to look, I looked forward to. I always knew I had to go to, to go to sleep before Grandma, though, because if I didn't, then her snoring kept me up. <laughs> She would let us stay up late and sleep in, and in the mornings we would we always watch the prices right. Still a favorite for me. Pancakes were a favorite, as Casey mentioned. Grandpa would, a would ask us what animal shape we wanted, and he would try to make a pancake in that shape. They were usually just a big blob, but he always we always appreciated his effort. And then he would eat. Then we would eat them at that little red table with the little red chairs. Her large bathtub was also something I looked forward to. <laughs> After taking a bath, we would sit on the little carpeted step that was built in front of the bathtub, and she would wrap us in about two or three different towels. My earliest memories of Grandma are of her zipping around town in her little red Honda. Grandma was a sweet lady, but she also had a little bit of spice to her, and it, was usually, and it usually came out when she was driving. <laughs> Gary used to mimic her when, when he was little. Come on, lady, he would say, referring to her driving commentary. <laughs> we would go to King's, her favorite store in town, and she would buy yarn or some little craft item that was to go with the next project that she was making. She made so many things for the family, all things that I cherish today. And then there was the infamous Avon book deliveries, which we've all mentioned. We would go up and down the blocks and throw all the little Avon books out and then afterwards she would take us to the gas station and we could buy a treat. She taught me all the basics of how to sew and how to use a sewing machine. She was creative and I have so many things that she made for me. Quilts and bean bags, those fleece dinosaurs, Barbie furniture and holiday decor made from her plastic canvas. Her need to be creative sort of latched onto me, and that is very much who I am today. <laughs> Holidays were a big deal at her house, and especially Christmas. Her Christmas tree, her Christmas trees were, were huge, and she took such great pride in decorating them. Putting out her Christmas decorating decorations was, was just fun, and her chocolates were, were such a treat. Everyone knew that if you went to her house during Christmas time, you could usually sneak a handful of chocolate buttons that she used to, to melt down for, for dipping. I think she would buy extra just because she knew the family would sneak, sneak some. Grandma gave the best hugs and always had a way of making me feel loved and special. 
I think everyone felt like they were her favorite. Her house was where I went to just relax as a teen and talk to her about anything and everything. And she never, she was never too busy or judgmental. She was always available. You could always count on her being home. In high school, we would go to her house after cheer practice and make chocolate chip pancakes, and she always welcomed us and loved the company. There are many characteristics and things about me that are bits and pieces of grandma sprinkled in. When I was preparing this talk and thinking about all, the, all of my fondest memories of grandma, I realized how all these things are what made me who I am. All of these things that she loved are all the things that I love. A need for creativity, a love for gardening and flowers. She couldn't have picked a better time just when all the lilacs, fa her favorite, are in bloom. A little bit of sweetness with a little bit of spice and a big love for, for her family and her dogs. <laughs> in fact, I often joke that there is a little old lady inside of me just bursting to come out. <laughs> so now I'm pretty sure I know where that little old lady came from. <laughs> A few days ago, while going through Grandma's things, I came across this letter that Grandpa wrote to, about Grandma or to Grandma. I'm not really quite sure where it came from. And I would maybe like to sort of represent Grandpa and read close with that. Helen, my wife, what well says Helen at the top? My wife. Helen has been my better half for 54 years. At the time, I, apparently they were married for 54 years. We were married in the Logan Temple on March 14th, 1947. Shortly after, I returned home from the Army. She has been my best friend and constant companion since. I can't envision life without her. She has always been my steady influence. On December 7th, 1999, I entered the hospital for what was to be a short stay or of five or six days. Six months later, I got out. For that six months, Helen was at the hospital every day, whether she felt like it or not. It was what I looked forward to each day. She is a confidant and sounding board for our children and most of our grandchildren. And the love of my life Her daughters-in-law also come to her for advice and guidance. I can't, sum up in, I can't sum up in a few words our life together. Suffice it to say that there is none other than I can envision having spent the last 54 years with. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Hello, um, my name is Alexandra Osler. I am Helen's oldest great-grandchild, and before we sing today, we wanted to give a little explanation of why we're singing this non-traditional funeral song. Um, so Grandma loved kids, and she also loved music. And one of her favorite callings was being the primary chorister, and so we're going to sing today in memory of her popcorn popping. I couldn't help but be reminded uh, in this building, Mom was uh, the chorister quite often and for sacraments and other things. And I always remember her right there. She loved the singing over here. And she looked mad. It was the oddest thing. Here was the sweetest lady in the world, and she stood up here and she loved the singing, and she kind of had a scowl on her face. My friends in the ward would ask me, how come your mom's always mad when she leads the singing? And we never said anything to her. I think it was about 10 years later, I said, Mom, why are you always mad? Really, I, I scowl? She had no idea. And anyway, I should have told her sooner, I guess. 
Um, one trait I inherited from mom is uh, procrastination. I'm terrible. And I finished this talk about uh, 9.30. And having Carly talk about her Christmas trees, they were enormous and they were big productions. She'd flock them. And I, it reminded me, uh, sometimes the tree didn't get finished until a week before Christmas. And there was one year in particular when Christmas passed and it never got decorated. The next two days after Christmas, she decorated it. <laughs> oh, we, we would uh, tease her about that every year. As I get, uh, started to think about what I could talk about to describe uh, Mom's life and, and try to give everyone an idea of what kind of woman she was. I thought I'd write down some, some words that would <clears throat> that would encapsulate um, her. And one word came to came to mind immediately um, to me, and, and it wasn't something I'd ever really thought about before. It was just how <clears throat> it was how I knew my mom to be to the core. Um, I started asking others the same. I said, tell me in one word how you would describe mom. Every single time I asked the question, the same word came out, whether it was family, friends, and that word is... Doggone it, I've been fined up till now. <clears throat> Empathy. So I hope to give you a, a few examples today of how she led her life in that way. Some other words that would follow. Loving kindness, trusting, positive outlook, service. Avon. Um, it's funny how she started selling Avon to help support Brad when he left on his mission and it became just something she did all the time. Uh, Garrett, when he found out all the grandkids were talking, he says, Should, maybe I ought to tell him now that, because I delivered books longer than any of them. He was the last uh, grandchild. And he says, none of them know that I got paid $5 instead of $1. <laughs> it was sweet. So now you know. Um, all of my friends knew that when their birthdays came around, they'd get Avon. And they didn't mind, you know. Mom had, in her bedroom, the whole wall was were drawers. And they were just full of Avon. We were carrying had to be thousands of dollars worth of inventory, Avon. But it was sweet because we could go in there and anytime we forgot a birthday or whatever, we'd just grab a, a gift and wrap it. Um, you know, I remember giving my friends the sales pitch on how Skin So Soft was a great mosquito repellent, you know. <laughs> I heard her give it so much. I don't know that she ever made any money. We never knew, Dad never knew. <laughs> She'd go around and, and I think it was a means to, to visit people. And I think there was a lot of people that bought Avon because they could visit with Mom. Um, boxes, Avon boxes, oh, you guys all remember those? Every week those would come, be delivered on the porch, three, four, five. 
And it got to be where they were handy to use to store their things in. It got to be where they were everywhere. And we'd complain about them jokingly, you know. And um, It's been about 10 years since she's done the Avon thing. And, and I don't know about everyone else, but... It's odd. <clears throat> I've I hang on to all those. Keep preparing them. something that helps me think about <clears throat> lighter subject I guess Avon was a lighter subject but um, games uh, Chuck, Brad and I played ball basketball mainly, but she would come to our games and it was just fun to have her come because she was so loud. Here's this quiet little lady who would cheer like nobody's business. I mean, it was always positive cheering. It was never yelling at the refs or anything. Maybe a little bit, but I... Um, but she would yell so much and squeal that uh, there was many days uh, the next day she lose her voice. Um, she continued supporting all the grandkids too, but it, it was funny around the house. You'd, you'd be somewhere in the house, in the corner of the house, and you'd hear her scream and squeal. You knew she was watching a jazz game. Yahoo! And, and that's, it was funny. Um, she was a great cook. She was a great support. One uh, story I, I thought was, I, I'd relate, I, I recalled it when I was preparing this, was uh, she was a wonderful Kirk Baker, better than she knew. Uh, um, remember her cabbage buns, uh, loved those, mountain pancakes, pumpkin rolls. But, but one story, um, I was in the 4-H, and I don't remember why I was in the 4-H, but there was a 4-H troop around. And we had a meeting, and everybody was assigned to make something to take to the county fair to compete in the youth baking or making. And, and I was assigned to make some cookies. I went home and just immediately forgot about it. And a few days later, my 4-H leader showed up at the door. He was ready to pick up my cookies to take them to the county fair. I said, Mom, I need some cookies, quick. Or what should I do? Well, I just made some. Uh, they're in the freezer. Just grab them and give those to her. So I did. Didn't think anything of it. And a couple weeks later, I got a blue ribbon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm so embarrassed I didn't tell the leader or anybody. But <clears throat> Another time, uh, Chuck remembers uh, pulling prank. Um, I guess he and Trudy got up every morning to get ready for school, and Trudy always had cereal. So one time he decided he'd fill the sugar bowl full of salt. She didn't eat cereal that morning, and he forgot about it. Well, Mom made some pies that day, and she, she made them for a bake sale and made the pies, and I think she took them. And he came home and, and ponied up, told her that what he'd done, and she rushed to get the pies. Anyway. Another thing she would make every year was chocolates, and I remember her and Aunt Marybeth would get together and do them quite often. I think Aunt Marybeth was, was really good at it, and she taught Mom, and then Mom taught all of her daughters, maybe some of them. But she would make hundreds, hundreds of them, and put them on uh, uh, cookie sheets, 
in her bedroom or her sewing room, and they'd lay all around, and they were off limits to everybody. Nobody could eat any. I don't understand who she made them for. We had to say, Mom, <clears throat> let us eat them. You know, what'd you make them for? Well, I didn't make them to have you eat them all at once. Okay. I don't remember her even eating them that much, but uh, it was the, f the fun was going in and sneaking them and, and her catching us. I think she got a kick out of that because she understood how much we really we liked them. Another word, kindness. Uh, not only was mom empathetic uh, to a degree that I, I still have trouble comprehending how, how empathetic she was, but she taught us the same thing uh, through her service, through her examples. She's always taking care of the elderly women in, in this ward, or the 12th ward is what we started out in. In fact, when they opened the uh, cornerstone over here of this building in 2012, it was a 50 year event where they opened it. It was full of our pictures and family pictures in there. So we, went, we were in this building uh, close to 60 years, I think mom and dad were. Sister Young, uh, Sister Clark, everybody remember Sister Clark. Um, Housley, Yates, Ramsey, good grief. They're, I can drive around this area and, and point at houses right and left of, of elderly ladies that she would take under her arm and she would take care of them. She'd do their hair before church. She, and, and I know them well because, I don't know about Chuck and Brad if they had this experience, but I would go with her and while she was doing it, their hair, I would do their lawn, mow their lawn, do whatever, take care of them. <clears throat> I also remember her being the one in the neighborhood that would go around and collect money from all the neighbors when anybody passed away for flowers. She did that religiously. Trusting, in other words, this is something that my brothers and sisters talked about a lot when, when we got together and, and they were helping me remind me things to talk about about her. And the late nights, I mean, that was classic mom. Uh, Dad, he'd go to bed at 9.30, consistently. And uh, she was, so she was there when we got home from dates. And uh, it was great. She was wonderful. She'd cover for us. We had curfews. And we were, you know, some, we were okay. Uh, we'd try to get home, but we were often late. And she always covered for us, never told Grandpa, um, unless we really needed his persuasion. Um, there was a special time for us. We'd sit and talk to Mom. Sometimes we'd get home at 1 o'clock, and we'd sit and talk to her till 2 about our, our date or our time out with our friends. And she was, she was so interested in what we, we were doing. and And... And just uh, love to hear about anything that we did. So she, you know, I asked uh, Chuck and a few others, why would you describe mom? Well, she was our defender. She defended us. I don't know if that's a real proper way to say it against dad, because it's not as though dad was ever... I don't remember getting any spankings. Chuck does. So I think he mellowed out as the years went on. But she was our defender in the way that he was the disciplinarian, and I, I think it was a good cop, bad cop type relationship, and it worked really well. Mom was the one we could always in, confide in, and without fear of retribution, what we talked about, but Dad kept us in line, and we needed that. We loved him for it. Um, she wasn't. A disciplinarian, as I say, but when she said, wait till your father get home, we would straighten up and fly right her. You know, that was how she did it. She always believed what we told her. She had confidence. She had trust in us, and, and we may have taken advantage of that a little bit as we grew up. Uh, some might even call her gullible, but I, I don't think she was gullible. I think she... It was more important for her to show us that 
she had complete trust. And it was, it's interesting how that taught us. Because if you ever took advantage of that, the guilt that you would feel was, was uh, heavy on your mind. And you may not have corrected it right away, but that guilt hung with you for years. The guilt was a better teacher than a stern talking to. Later on, we became mom's defenders. <clears throat> I remember this uh, incident in particular because I was this dumb little kid and it just made a big impression on me. Um, Bonnie and I were in the backyard one day. Don't know what we're doing. It was this in the summer, I think. We smelled smoke, and we ran around the front of the house, and and the vacant lot was on fire. And I mean, it was this vacant lot had grass this high, you know, that old dry June grass. It's just like gasoline when it starts on fire. And there were trees in the, in there. So we ran in and told mom, mom, you need to call the fire department. So she did, and then we walked out to watch them come and put the fire out. <clears throat> Just then, uh, the neighbor that lives next to the vacant lot, we didn't really know him too well. We knew him okay, I guess, but they weren't close neighbors. They came out and walked over to us and asked about the fire, and mom, Proudly said, well, you know, my kids saw it and I called the fire department, thinking this lady would have been grateful that maybe her home was saved. But this lady immediately lit into mom, telling her how, you know, why'd you call the fire department so early? I'd like that field to burn because I get mice and bugs in my house. And just <clears throat> lit into mom, and mom said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry, and turned around and went back to the house. A little bit later, uh, Chuck pulled up the house. <clears throat> and he went in and saw Mom crying. Chuck's a pretty uh, confident guy. He's, he's not one that is easily riled, though. But I remember him not saying a word turning, coming to Bonnie and I, what happened? We told him, boom, he was down at that neighbor's house. I didn't hear it, but later we asked him what he said. He said, you made my mom cry. You come up here and you apologize to her. I mean, he was... <clears throat> Chuck was only, I don't know, 17. <clears throat> Mom just had the biggest hurt. Anyway, the neighbor did come up and apologize. And uh, <clears throat> uh, regarding her kindness, temperance, um, I, I do remember uh, somebody mentioned her driving. Knucklehead was a common phrase. That was about as far as extent to talking about another driver. But a couple weeks ago. Maple Springs called and, and she had fallen and cut her, her leg pretty bad and they were going to take her to the hospital. So Bonnie went and met her there. And uh, Bonnie said she was in an incredible amount of pain at that time. And Bonnie kept waiting for a cuss word to come out. Never, mom never cussed, never did. Well, maybe once or twice. Uh, but mostly it was uh, you shite, poke, fiddlesticks, H-E double toothpick. 
heckin' 40, I have no idea what that means. And we would ask her, and she didn't know. She probably learned it from her mother. Um, ending on empathy, uh, some people might say that, like, as I mentioned, mom was empathetic to a fault. Uh, some people may have taken advantage of that, but, but that was their, their fault and not hers. Um, um, my first recollections, Mom. And I'm going to mix something to my siblings. I'm not proud of because I hope I don't do it as much as I did, but I was a terrible sulker. If you, if you would ask them, describe Scott as a, as a growing up, they'd say, oh man, he was a sulker. I always sulk. Well, I finally figured out why I was. Uh, it was, uh, I had the, the lucky time of being with mom the most alone. Uh, Bonnie went to school, and I was home alone with her. Had a lot of special times with her, but I do remember her one time in particular. I was probably three. She scolded me. I did something pretty bad. She scolded me to the point where it really hurt my feelings. I started to cry, and I maybe sulked a little bit. And she felt bad about scolding her child. Came and apologized to me profusely. Hugged me, kissed me. <clears throat> that was pretty sweet. <laughs> and I went back to that well over and over. <clears throat> I was the baby. <clears throat> that was the, uh, the mechanism or the thing that leveled the playing field for me because I, uh, I thought I was harassed a lot by him. Probably wasn't that much, but... Looking back, I, I do remember things like, hey, Scott, we're going to play hide in the seat, go climb in the clothes dryer. <laughs> and then they turned it on. <laughs> and I think Dad ran when he heard my head bouncing around against the drum. I remember Chuck and Brad rubbing rotten apricots in my face until I threw up. <laughs> so that was probably as bad as it got, but... Anyway, that, they know how I got, how I started that. Um, uh, one story that uh, exemplifies her level of empathy is one that Brad told me. Um, he and Mom were, he was driving Mom through Salt Lake. And they were driving through a shady part of town and uh, the red light district. And uh, Brad made a comment, uh, boy, I hate to see, that's disgusting seeing those women do what they have to do. And mom, you know, she was a little bit naive, but it was, I think her na naivety was uh, due that she just had such a high opinion of people. She didn't, she thought so highly of them but uh, she said, what do you mean? Well, he explained to him, to her, that they were ladies of the evening. And she said, oh, oh, yes. I understand. And she started to cry. <clears throat> that was mom to the core. She didn't judge people. She didn't talk down to anybody. She had empathy for them. She wasn't better than anybody. And she taught us how to be that way with others. Dad was the same way. They taught us to respect other people no matter, no matter if their parents, their religion, their race, anybody. And it was quite an eye-opener for me when I, when I got older and, and saw that some people didn't think that way sad, but, you know, that's the way we were raised. And I attribute that to Mom and Dad. Um, one of my friends uh, that grew up in a couple houses down, you know, he came to our house now and then, but not an overwhelming amount. He sent me an email and says, uh, she was a kind and gentle soul who made my childhood a lot better. 
She had an, an influence on everybody she touched. She put uh, people at ease. My friends would love to come over to her house. We spent a lot of time there. And she knew what she was doing. She knew that if we were there, she knew where we was, and she knew what we were doing. But she made them feel so at home. I try to do that with my kids, too. <clears throat> there were some cases when I brought home a friend or a date when she really should have been suspect or... But she was so, didn't judge them, and uh, just admonished me to try to be influential to them and not the other way. I'm so grateful to have grown up with such a special lady. And my dad also grateful to them. I want to give a, a shout out to my Uncle Paul and Uncle Gary. They were always uh, kept tabs on Mom and called her. Appreciate that. We love you, Mom. I say it's the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Following these services, the interment will be at the Brigham City Cemetery where the dedicatory prayer will be offered by Jason Jensen. We would like to thank the Brigham City 23rd Ward Relief Society for their compassionate service. There will be a luncheon for the family back here in the cultural hall following the internment. We would remind you to travel safely and as you travel to and from the cemetery and returning to your homes, please obey all traffic rules. The pallbearers are Ryan Osler, Brock Henderson, Jason Jensen, Chase Jensen, Matthew Osler, Garrett Jensen, Devin Rose, and Mace Rockwood. The honorary pallbearers are Daniel Osler, Adam Jensen, Gabe Christensen, Britt Christensen, Casey Henderson, Drew Osler, and Tad Coleman. Following my remarks, the closing hymn will be hymn number 152, God Be With Us Till We Meet Again, and the benediction will be offered by Drew Osler. Several years ago, uh, President Russell M. Nelson uh, gave a talk about the three things that he would like said at his, at his funeral, and they are was able to render service to my fellow man. I had a fine family, and I had evidence of unshakable faith in God and lived accordingly. As you have shared um, your feelings about your mother, your grandmother, um, those things were evident to me that Helen was kind and loving and had unconditional love for others and was willing to help anyone. She had a fine family. You are evidence of that. And the left side of the program shows her posterity, and I think that's a wonderful list. She served faithfully in her callings, and apparently, as shared here, taught her children and grandchildren to choose the right. The examples that uh, Mackenzie and Carly shared about going to the temple and having faith in prayer. Brothers and sisters, I leave you my prayer and a blessing that you will find peace and joy in the coming weeks, months, and year in the absence of your mother, grandmother, and sister. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
our eternal God in heaven, we are grateful for the many people who have gathered here today to honor the life of Helen, to show our deep love for her and the great impact that she's had in our lives. We're thankful for her constant kindness, her loving heart, her gentle nature, and her giving demeanor. We appreciate her sweet companionship and pray that as we remember her life, that we will use it as a catalyst to better ours and those that we meet in this world. We look to the, exam we look to the example of Jesus Christ to redeem our dead, to follow the path of the Savior that we may see our dear ones once again and embrace in their company that we may continue to forgive others as we seek to be forgiven, that we may become the body of Christ as we care for one another and both suffer and rejoice together. Despite its impermanence, we show gratitude for life on this mortal earth and the many loving relationships we develop as here as we press forward with hope for eternal unity beyond this life. We pray for comfort of the many people in this chapel peace for those that mourn and struggle. We especially seek consolation for Helen's children, that they may feel their parents' deep love for them and also the love of their heavenly parents. And we pray that we might give them our love during, the, the, during this dark time. As we part, we pray that we may take Helen's memory with us and that we will find peace in the gospel of Jesus Christ that it will give us strength and hope for brighter days and reunions yet to come. And this prayer we offer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.